All right, so we're going to finish up the integumentary system with this uh, power, uh, PowerPoint slide show right here. Uh, the next one is a lot of information. So if you finish up this pretty quickly, you might want to go ahead and move on and start the next section, Chapter 7, which is, I believe, the skeletal unit. Sebaceous glands are holocrine glands, holo meaning whole. Uh, these produce a fatty sebum type material which keeps hair and skin soft and waterproof. That uh, sebum though, when it, it is in excess, can actually cause acne. Um, these are usually associated with hair follicles. Um, you do not have these on the palms of your hands and the soles of your feet. So sudoriferous glands, these are sweat glands, and this one's pretty easy to keep straight, sudor or odor, kind of rhyme and go together. Uh, so it's easy to remember when you see the word sudoriferous that this is a sweat gland. Uh, these are found all over in the uh, deeper layer of the dermis or the subcutaneous layer. Subcutaneous layer. We have uh, more than one type. Eccrine are going to be the most abundant, and those respond to changes in or increases, we should say, in body heat, which makes sense because when we get hot, we sweat. Um, these are found mostly on the forehead, the neck, and the back, and they produce sweat during exercise, high heat, and uh, when we get nervous, sometimes we can have some nervous system um, autonomous responses that cause our palms to actually get sweaty. We'll save that for 82. Eccrine sweat glands uh, respond primarily to uh, body temperature as well, elevated body temperature. Sweat contains, I uh, already said that, sorry. Sweat contains salts uh, and waste like urea. Uh, and you can also get rid of some uh, toxic compounds through your sweat. Um, so that's one of the reasons why people say it's good to sweat is because you can actually re release something when you exercise actually from the fat cells and then some things you can release on out through the sweat. sweat. African glands are scent type glands, okay? These are like scent glands. Um, these are most abundant in the axilla or armpit area and in the groin. Um, and they are a type of sweat glands. They become active at puberty and they uh, possess ducts that open out into hair follicles. Um, we also have specialized glands like uh, to produce things like milk from a mammary gland or a serumineous gland, which is actually what produces your earwax. Um, and so that milk and earwax are secreted from a modified sweat gland. They're modified in order to produce those. The integumentary system is really important. Uh, it's an important component of homeostasis. It helps to regulate body temperature by, by sweating to cool us down. Uh, it also helps to uh, sense and trigger shivering in the muscles to warm up. Uh, our body heat is going to produce, I'm sorry, our metabolism is going to produce some body heat. We have a very large surface area to allow that heat to radiate away from our body. So I want you to think about those 70 trillion cells that we have, and these are all producing heat. And if we didn't have a way to let that escape, our temperature would constantly be rising. And so we need to have a way in order for that to be able to leave the body and radiate away, okay? This is why getting close to someone, skin-to-skin uh, -skin contact can actually warm you up. And so that's why when you're in uh, a situation where you're very cold and hypothermia, they suggest skin-to-skin -skin contact because the other person can help warm you up, okay? Um, skin actually kind of likes, uh, is kind of like a window, okay? It can insulate, uh, it can allow uh, blood a large surface area in order to cool. So when we exercise, I want you to think about this, what happens to your face besides sweating? It gets red, right? And that's because you are sending the blood to the surface where it can actually cool off. And if you think about all the surface area you have along your body, that's a large area to be able to cool off. So it's kind of like back in the old days when your great grandma would put a pie in the window to let it cool off for a little while. The circulation can help you to cool off. Uh, and you also want to think about the fact that when it's really cold, what does your body do? It pulls the blood in away from that area, from the skin, to keep your internal organs warm. So it works both ways. 
All right, so I kind of did touch on a little bit of this already. Heat is that byproduct of cellular metabolism, and our integumentary system um, helps to uh, re relieve that heat in order to let it radiate away, okay? Because we have lots of blood vessels in our skin. Our skin is very vascular, uh, and they constrict and dilate, which changes the amount of uh, blood that is able to get to the surface, um, if you get really cold, your face gets paler because the blood is drawn back into the body to keep the organs warm. And if uh, you are hot, they can constrict. And of course, like we said, your face reddens when the blood vessels are uh, dilated. Sorry, not constricted. When they're dilated, you get more to the surface um, in order to be able to pull it down. So this is really through conduction and convection, releasing uh, heat um, more so. Uh, conduction moves heat from the body directly into the molecules of cooler objects. Heat always goes from high to low. Uh, convection is when a warm surface loses heat to the air. Okay, and that's when you get this convection uh, current circulating. So air molecules continuously circulating over it uh, which helps the heat move on away. Sweat, why do you think sweat cools us down? I want you to think about that for a moment. Most people think, well, because it's wet and the water cools it down. Well, it actually cools you down by what we call evaporative cooling. So when we sweat, the water actually evaporates. And I like to explain this by drawing a diagram. Um, and so I want you to think about the molecules of a liquid versus the molecules of a gas, okay? So the molecules of a liquid are a bit closer together, and I know that's terrible drawing, but this pen isn't great. So, so the molecules of a liquid are closer together. They have more what we call intermolecular forces. They have more ties together. And so which of these two do you think are going to move, this is a liquid and this is a solid, faster? Well, you probably already know that a gas is moving faster. Gas has more energy. So in order to go from the liquid phase to a gaseous phase, you have to have an input of energy. You've got to get energy from somewhere. And so heat is a form of energy. And so evaporative cooling, what it does is you have that liquid on your body, right? That liquid water. And as it evaporates to go from a liquid to a solid, it cools heat or energy heat and form of energy away from your body so that it can phase change to a gas. And so that's the reason that it actually cools you down is, is due to the uh, vaporization going from a liquid to a solid, okay? Most body heat is primarily lost by radiation. So this is a good example of that negative feedback cycle. Remember, negative feedback is going to move things towards the normal set point. A positive feedback system moves things further away until some stimulus stops it. So remember, that's kind of a rare occurrence in the body for things like maybe childbirth. Uh, negative feedback is what most things in the body or how most things in the body function. So if you think about this basically just like your thermostat for your AC or heater in the house, okay? So if your body heat goes too high, your sensors are going to sense that stimulus, okay? Body temperature rises above normal. The thermoreceptors then sense that. They're going to send signals to the control center, which is the hypothalamus. The hypothalamus says, ooh, hey, we're getting too hot. And so it then sends another message back to the effector. And in this case, the effector is going to be uh, blood vessels in the skin and cause them to dilate right, so that you can get more blood out to the window where it can cool down, and it's going to cause the sweat glands to begin producing sweat, all right, and so that's two ways that your body is cooling down. One is by radiation, and two, well, let me, let me point that out. Um, think about when you get really hot, what happens to your heart rate? It increases, right, so you've got more blood going out and they're dilating, uh, and so then you have the evaporative, uh, evaporative cooling going on, and so your body has that response. And then you're going to, some receptors are then gonna sense that it is back towards normal and then shut all of that down, okay? So it works the opposite way as well. If your body temperature gets too low, uh, receptors are gonna sense that. And again, these are gonna be thermoreceptors. 
Uh, we have all different types of, of receptors in our body that we'll learn about in, uh, i pretty sure it's AP2 that we'll learn about the different receptors. Um, so they're going to send a signal to the control center, which is still the hypothalamus, uh, and it's going to say, hey, we're getting too far below this set point. It's going to send the message to the effector, which is uh, generally going to be uh, often, uh, again, blood vessels. So those are going to constrict, okay, and hold the blood in closer. And then muscles are going to be activated to cause shivering to bring your temperatures up, all right? And so it really just works like your thermostat, okay? So if you have an air conditioner and it gets above, say, 72, then your air kicks on, right? It'll stay on long enough and it'll drop it down to about 70, and then it'll kick off. And then if it drops down and gets too cold, gets below to like 68, and then the heater's gonna kick on. And then it's gonna drive that heat back up to 71 or 72, and then it's gonna kick off. And so you'll have a little bit of a range there that your body can tolerate. So when we have problems with temperature regulation, hyperthermia being normally high body temperature, hyper means above, Hypo means below, so that's an abnormally low body temperature. Um, when it's really humid outside, the air is saturated with water. That means there's a lot of water in a vapor form, all right? And so that makes it harder for us to sweat. Because remember we talked about evaporative uh, cooling, we were going from a liquid to a gas, okay? And when we're talking about things like a concentration gradient, things always want to go from high to low. Okay, so if there's more water on your skin, so let's say this is your skin down here than there is in the air. Oh, I did that backwards. If there's more water on your skin than there is in the air, you're going to be going down the concentration gradient, right? And so that makes evaporative, evaporative cooling hard. But if it's humid, it kind of tips that balance the opposite direction, okay? So heat goes from high to low. So we can't lose heat that way. We're not losing heat also by radiation. And so then that's going to accumulate. So this is one of the reasons why it is so important in summertime that there are periods of cooling off because your body is not able to lose that heat that you're generating uh, via meta metabolism, all right? So you just continue to get hotter and hotter and hotter. Uh, hypothermia occurs at 106 degrees Fahrenheit. So if your temperature is 106 degrees, that is hyperthermia. Uh, in the core body temperature, that's going to cause, uh, in the core body temperature, I'm saying, uh, that's going to cause symptoms of things like weakness, nausea, dizziness, uh, headache, and a very high pulse. Um, 105.8 is the average temperature that it takes to actually start breaking down proteins to denature proteins. So it does become very serious at that point. Hypothermia uh, is lowered body temperature, okay? It can occur with exposure to cold temperatures or during an Ill illness, and it starts out with feeling cold, of course, and shivering. Uh, and then if it's not taken care of, uh, the patient will experience things like confusion, lethargy, uh, slower reflexes, um, and then they're not thinking straight, and so they do things that don't make sense. They'll eventually lose consciousness, and major, major organs begin to shut down. Drops in the core body temperature of just a few uh, degrees can actually cause respiratory failure or arrhythmia. Um, the extremities can handle a 20 to 30 degree drop. Okay, so where this drop is is really important. Uh, elderly people are more prone to hypothermia because as you get older, the uh, fat, the subcutaneous adipose or fat tissue um, actually decreases that it's right under the skin. So that's, that's um, not necessarily means that they're very thin, it's just the fat tends to be concentrated more in the core of the body, not under their skin. And so this is why if you have a mother or grandmother uh, or great uncle or whatever that tends to be cold all the time when it's really not that cold They can't help it. It's really just because they don't have that extra uh, Layer of protection in their skin. Okay, now when we're talking about hyper hyperthermia We're not talking about fevers fevers are quite a little bit different animal and When you have a fever your body actually changes the set point um, Which is why you shiver when you when you when you get a uh, high temperature when you get chills with that the shivering is because your body's trying to keep that set point so that's a little bit different okay 
So how does healing occur for wounds and things like burns? Um, inflammation is a normal response to an injury or stress. It has a, uh, it is something that is supposed to happen. Now, sometimes inflammation is a little too much and we treat the symptoms of that, but it really does have a purpose. Blood vessels that are in the tissues uh, that have been affected dilate and they become leaky. They become more permeable and that allows fluids to leak out into the damaged tissues. Well, why would that be a good thing? Okay. Um, so I want you to think about that. First off, what did we say happens when blood vessels dilate? The skin becomes red. So what are one of the things that we see with inflammation? Redness, right? And if it dilates, we're getting more fluids, okay? So think about making a wider, um, goodness gracious, I'm having a moment there, a senior moment, um, a wider pipe. <laughs> It, that you're bringing fluids in, so you're bringing more fluids, and so this is where swelling is coming in. But why would you want to bring more blood to an injured area? Well, you want more white blood cells there, right? You want more fluids there, okay? Um, and you want to be able to bring things to cause blood clots and all, so you've got to have a way to get it there. And our vascular system is our highway system, so that's how we get everything there, okay? Um, and so they become more permeable, which means they're more leaky, and so they allow those fluids and those white blood cells to be able to get out through the gaps in the uh, vessels, that the cells that are holding the vessels um, together, so they can go through the cell walls and leak out those important things um, to the wind, okay? And so inflammation, you're going to have, we call it rubor color, dolor, and two more, and that's redness, swelling, heat, and pain, okay? Pain is an important response. Uh, without pain, we often don't know when to stop. All right, so why do some cuts cause scars and others don't? Well, if you get a small, shallow cut, uh, the epidermal cells along that margin um, can divide more rapidly than usual, and they replenish that gap with new cells, and so they often will not uh, cause a scar. But if the cut is deep enough to go into the dermis or the subcutaneous layer, layer um, and, and break that, then you're going to form a clot, okay? When you form a clot, then you're going to have a scab form. Fibroblasts from the wound uh, are going to move in and lay down new collagenous fibers. This is when you start to see scarring. Uh, you have growth factors that uh, stimulate and cause new tissue to form. Uh, you have phagocytic cells. Do you remember what phagocytes are? Phago means eat, and cytic is cell, so cell eating. So phagocytes come and they kind of clean everything up. They remove the dead cells and debris and uh, other things there. And then those collagenous fibers, like I said, are the things that actually cause the scarring. So this is just kind of giving you that overview of uh, what is going on as this uh, healing occurs. You can see the beginning here at A, it looks normal, and then these blood vessels begin to uh, dilate, become more leaky. You get more fluids here and you start to form a blood clot, right? And then you get a scab that forms and then you're gonna have fibroblasts lay down and some scar tissues. Then the scab eventually leaves, but you still have some scar tissue in there, unfortunately. But it's it's fortunate because that's what stops you from just continuing to bleed and from uh, bacteria continuing to get in. A scab also helps block bacteria from getting in and causing infection. All right, so we're going to look at burns and then we're going to look at, uh, well, let's just start right here. Okay, so we have first, a second, and third degree burn. So first degree burn only affects the epidermis, okay, the top layer. Uh, it is superficial, and it is what we call a partial thickness burn. It only affects that top layer. Then we have a second degree burn, and that is going to be deeper, but it is still partial thickness. It does not go all of the way. Okay? Uh, third degree burns are a full thickness burns. They, they, they go all the way through the uh, epidermis and the dermis both. Right? Um, we deal with these uh, burns with things like an autograft or a homograft or various skin substitutes. Auto means self, so this would be skin taken from your own body, uh, removed from another area of the body in the place to wherever you need it. 
homograft means the same, so this would come from another human being. And then we actually have like artificial skin that we use, or they sometimes would do a xenograft type thing, which would be from another species even. Um, so it's kind of interesting some of the things they do for burns now. So the rule of nines is really important. This is how we calculate or estimate the surface area of a burn. This is important to understand and be able to do because you need to know how much fluids a person needs because remember, uh, the skin pre um, prevents desiccation or the body from drying out. All right, you also need to be able to calculate how many meds to get, do they qualify, give, do they qualify for the burn unit, that type of thing, all right? So you are definitely going to see this again. Uh, we usually do this as an essay in class, so I would strongly recommend that you draw this out a few times. Uh, it's not hard to remember, um, but you will need to know this uh, in the nursing program if you're going to nursing, okay? So what the way this works is you can see here the face is going to be 4.5% on the front, the anterior side, and the posterior side is 4.5%, so that times 2 is going to be 9%, all right? And so the extremities, the arms are smaller than the legs, so the arms are four and a half for the anterior and the posterior, so that's nine, and then the other arm would make that 18. So that's gonna be a total of 18. All right, the trunk is gonna be 18 on the front and 18 on the back. And I'm kind of running out of room there. Uh, this is going to be for a total of 32, all right? And then so the legs are nine on the front and nine on the back, so they're 18 each, so that's going to be another 32. And then the, uh, or 36, gosh, y'all, my math is terrible, 36. Uh, and so then the perineum is just 1%, and that should total, um, give you a total of 100%. And so you would just look at each part of the body that is covered and add those all together to get the percentage of the body uh, that has been burned, or of the skin, I should say. Okay, so what happens to our skin over time? I bet you already know some of these, and I, I can already tell you some of these for sure. Uh, we get wrinkles. Uh, our skin becomes drier, so it gets kind of a scaly appearance. We get age spots. I don't know if you can see them in here, but I've, I've got some age spots already. Um, the epidermis thins. The dermis also uh, becomes reduced. And of course, we've already discussed having that loss of fat under the dermis. We get wrinkles and sagging. Um, sebaceous glands secrete less oil, so that's one of the reasons our skin is more dry. Your melanin production slows. The hair thins. Uh, baldness and the number of hair follicles have some interesting um, research going on where they're looking at stem cells and so a future treatment may come from uh, stem cells from the bulb reach at the base of the hair follicles. So that's kind of an interesting thing that I might be able to do. Um, Acne can actually occur again. People tend to think that acne is just for uh, prepubescence or pubescence, teenagers, and it is very increased there, but it does continue on into adulthood. That's actually a disorder of the sebaceous, sebaceous glands or overproduction. Um, decreased sensory uh, receptors in the skin and ability, inability to regulate body temperature uh, also occur. Um, one thing that's really important is you, you have a very difficult time activating vitamin D, partially because you're inside more, but even if you are outside more. So you have to find ways to really get that vitamin D in and get that activated for seniors. So this is something that's really important to consider, uh, especially in long-term care places. They need to be out in the sunlight as much as possible, and that's really hard to do. So that's something we all should work on if we're working in a long-term facility. And uh, that should finish up chapter six. And so I'm just gonna remind you, this was a very short chapter. Uh, when I had originally put it in, it was in with the um, midterm. Um, and so it's in a week by itself, I believe, after I reorganized it. Um, 
and skeletal chapter seven is long so i would really work hard at getting this done and getting this finished and moving on to chapter seven i know you don't want to hear that but i'm just warning you ahead of time we get to skeletal in the muscular system there's a lot of information especially in lab but in lecture as well okay so uh, do yourself a favor and take heed get this is a nice easy chapter get it done and move on to the other one a little early